Amen. I do love the words of that song, and I do think it's very fitting with what we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you have your Bibles, take them and open them, please, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking from verse 25 down to verse number 34, finishing up chapter 6, finishing up this section of the Sermon on the Mount, and I have entitled the sermon for this morning, Contentment in Christ and His Kingdom as the Cure for Anxiety. Contentment in Christ and His Kingdom as the Cure for Anxiety. Once you have found it, I know you literally just sat down, but once you've found it, if you're able, please stand again with me for the reverence of the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with the 25th verse, the Word of the Lord reads, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Thus ends this reading of the holy, inspired, and errant, infallible word of the living God. Receive it as such, and let's pray together. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we thank you, Lord, that in Christ we find not only salvation, but contentment. And in that contentment, we find the cure for our anxious, riddled hearts, for, for our worry, for our fears. We find in Christ the cure for it all. For in Jesus, we have not just a Lord, not just a Savior, but a Redeemer, an intercessor, one who loves us and cares for us despite our constant unworthiness, one who makes us worthy in your sight, Father. And so we thank you this morning for Jesus. We thank you for the promises of your word that we cling to. And we thank you that you have, in fact, given us this cure for anxiety. Lord, if there's one here this morning who does not know you as Lord and Savior, or perhaps one who's listening, I pray that you would lead them and draw them to salvation today. Lord, for those that do know you, I pray that you would strengthen us through your word and that you would help us to battle anxiety, not, not with a humanistic effort, but Lord, that we would do so according to your word and your promises and the strength and contentment that Christ has wrought within our souls. So Lord, I pray that you would speak through me this morning, hide me behind your cross, make these words yours, not mine, and get the glory, honor, and praise you alone deserve, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we consider this text this morning, if we went around and asked each one of us, have you ever struggled before with anxiety or with fear or with worry? I think the honest answer each of us would have to give is yes. To some degree or another, at one point or another, we have felt those feelings. Now, of course, some are more prone to anxiety than others are. Some are more prone to fear. Some are more prone to worry. I know the joke growing up was that I worried about a lot of different things. Even the other day, Andrew pointed out, I think it was, that if there's one person who knows what the word hypochondriac means, it's me. And that's true. Growing up, I was a very anxiety-driven individual. And I would be lying if I said to you that I don't still sometimes deal with some of those same thoughts and ideas. The the jokes that we make about obsessive compulsive disorder are not entirely jokes. There is actually a lot of truth to that for me. So 
as I was gathering this sermon this past week, as I was putting things together for it and studying it, I realized that I was first preaching the sermon to myself in preparation of then delivering the sermon to you. But I'm still preaching to myself this morning as well. And so as we consider this idea of anxiety, it's something that we're all familiar with and we're also aware that it's not good. We know it's wrong. We know that it's sinful. And we can understand why a non-believer, why somebody who's not a Christian would struggle with fear and worry. We get why non-believers have things like panic attacks because they've got no one they can trust in. They've got nobody they can turn to. They've got nobody that they can believe in. At the end of the day, what they have is despair rather than hope. What confuses us though is how is it that we as Christians can also have anxiety? How is it that we as Christians can worry about the same things that pagans do? And at the end of the day, I think the answer is pretty plain. It's pretty simple. What anxiety is, is it is a lack of trust, faith, and hope, not only in Jesus, but in the promises that God has given us in his word. And so then the cure for anxiety is trust, trust in God. But more than that, I think sometimes anxiety is also a symptom of one who is discontent, discontent in what God has done, in where God has placed us, in what God has called us to. And in that discontentment, we express it through worrying about the situations in which we find ourselves or the situations that we don't find ourselves in, but we wanted to. And so whether it be due to a lack of trust or a lack of contentment, anxiety, worry, and fear springs up within our hearts. And it's sinful because it not only distrusts God and is in sad, unsatisfied in Christ, but more than that, it becomes self-focused, self-consumed. And so rather than being generous with what we have, which is really one of the main things we saw throughout chapter six, rather than seeing others, actually seeing them and recognizing their needs, we become so consumed with, with self that we stingily hold on to everything. We, we refuse to be generous with what we have. And we're so consumed with ourselves, constantly worrying about everything that we fail to take notice of the needs of others. And so there are multiple ways in which anxiety becomes sinful and even self-destructive within our own lives. But there's a cure. And the cure, Jesus tells us within this text, is actually himself. Seeking him and his kingdom and his righteousness is the cure for anxiety because there in Christ is where we find contentment. And so what we're going to be looking at this morning are a number of ways in which the, the anxious individual is contrasted with the contented individual. We're going to see the contrast between the one who is riddled with worry, patterned by fear, and the one who actually trusts God, the one who is actually content with what God is doing, where God has placed us, where God is bringing us to. And as we see these, these contrasting individuals together, my hope and my prayer is that we will see that Christ is the cure. And not only is he the cure, my hope and prayer is that as we find contentment in him, we would learn how to do genuine battle against our anxieties, against our fears, and against our worries. And so this morning, I don't pretend to know what keeps you up at night. I don't pretend to know what that thought is or that idea that just seems to eat away at you during the day. And by the way, when I speak of anxiety and fear and worry, I'm not saying that you're somebody who trembles and shakes because you're constantly worried about these things. I'm talking more about the individual who is on edge, the one who lays awake at night with the beating heart thinking about 
how am I going to pay my bills? Or, or how am I going to deal with this nasty coworker of mine? Or how am I going to deal with this problem, this trial in my life? And through worrying, you think you're going to solve your problem, but actually it's self-destructive behavior. That's what we're focusing on. Although it does include the one who trembles in fear. It includes the one who is depressed because of their worries. How do we combat that in a God-centered, God-glorifying way? Well, that's what Jesus sets forth for us here within the text. And the first thing that we need to understand as we make our way through these verses, the first thing we need to see, number one, is that anxious thoughts worry over trivial things. Anxious thoughts worry over trivial things things. This has been true in my own life, and I'm sure you can attest to the validity of this as well. Often, the things we worry about never come to pass. The things we worry about today seem insignificant come tomorrow. And so worry and anxiety and fear of this nature, of this caliber, as we're going to see, not only does it distrust God, not only is it discontent, but it's actually just worrying over trivial, insignificant matters, things that God has already provided for if we would simply trust in him. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. So don't be anxious about your life, how long you're going to live, what your life looks like. Don't be anxious about that, nor are you to worry about what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? This actually goes back to what we've seen last week within this text, because last week we saw Jesus saying that we are to have eyes filled with light, generous eyes, giving what we have. Now, the one who gives away what they have generously is one who not only trusts in God, but is content with what they have. They're not worried or anxious about what they're going to eat or what they're going to wear or how others are going to perceive them or how they're going to get from today or to tomorrow. They trust in God. And because they trust in God, they have a peace and calmness about themselves that allows them to be generous with what they have. And in that generosity, they glorify the Lord. So here we're told, don't be anxious about these things. Beloved, you know the body is more than clothing. It's more than what you eat. It's more than what you drink. More than that, we're immortal until our work for Christ on this earth is done. More than that, this life isn't all there is. If we're in Christ, we are promised eternity. This life is not even like a full chapter. This is barely even an introduction or prologue to what is actually to come. This is preparation for that, if anything. And so the point is, we're not to look to these things with worry and fear and anxiety, but we are to see them as provisions that come from God on high that we are then to utilize for the good of those around us. As Jim Elliott once famously said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And we've already learned that the body is more than food because Jesus, quoting from Deuteronomy in Matthew 4, 4, combating the temptations of Satan said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. And we also know we can't add a single solitary second to our lives by worrying. People who worry think they can, but the truth is we can't. No person by worrying has ever added a second to their lives or taken a second from their lives because God has marked the number of our days before the foundation of the world and there is nothing we can do to change that. Now, I'm not speaking of that in a sort of deterministic way that you should cower and shake and shiver and fear. No, I'm saying that in a comforting way. Your heavenly father truly does have a plan for your life and that plan is going to be fulfilled for his glory. And then once that's done, you are going to be welcomed into his presence. 
to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We likewise know that the body is more than clothing. In the final analysis, it's not going to matter. Did you have expensive clothing? Were your clothes luxuriant? Did they look nice? It's not going to matter if you had the most expensive jewelry or the nicest makeup. What's going to matter is whether you were clothed or not in Christ. As Galatians 3, 26 to 27 tells us, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you believe in Jesus by faith, you are clothed and covered in the righteousness of God, and that is better than any earthly clothing you could ever find. But it comes through faith. Those who believe by faith in Jesus receive the bread of life. Those who believe in faith by Jesus receive the clothing, the covering that is the righteousness of Christ. Those who believe by faith, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we would be made the righteousness of God. Those who believe that by faith are not only saved and forgiven, but have every reason to be content in Jesus. But it begins and it ends with faith, trust, hope, and the promises of of God. This is why throughout almost the entirety of this chapter, Jesus continually uses this Greek word merimina to refer to anxiety. He uses various forms forms of it. But merimina is a, a sort of anxiety that completely consumes a person. A sort of a fear, a sort of worrying that takes over a person's mind so that they cannot focus on anything else. And what's interesting about this word merimina is that it is the antithesis or total complete opposite of the Greek word for faith, pistis. They are against one another. They are opposed to one another. So what Jesus is doing here is he is telling us that the one who has this sort of worry, this sort of anxiety, this sort of fear is opposed to him. We're actually sinning against God when we worry in this way. We're doing the opposite of faith, the opposite of trusting, the opposite of clinging to God's promises. It's as though we're looking at the promises of God and shaking our head and going, no, I can't believe that. Or we're looking at God himself and we're saying, I just can't be content in who he is for me. I can't be content with where he has placed me or with what he has given me. And in that discontent springs up all of this anxiety, which is actually opposed to God. It pushes God away. Now that's not to say that all worry is bad because some hearing this might go, well, if I'm not supposed to worry about food, I might as well not eat anymore. God will supply that, right? And if I'm not supposed to worry, I might as well not clothe myself anymore. God will figure that out when I walk out the door. It's not at all what he's saying, right? There are good forms of worry that God has implanted within us that sort of drive us forward to work. A sort of worry that naturally drives us to eat because if we don't eat, we recognize we will die. A sort of worry that drives us to clothe our bodies because, well, you don't need me to go on from there, but you get the point. Those are good concerns to have. Those are not opposed to faith. They're not opposed to God. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 to 12, we're told very clearly that we're to work. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Now, why do people become busybodies? Why do they become idle? Anxiety. Fear, worry. Some people will be driven to work too much and to be consumed by their work, to focus on the wrong thing in that way. But others, through anxiety and worry, will be driven to idleness. It's as though they will be completely frozen. And in both instances, they need to repent and they need to be encouraged to remember that such worrying is wrong. 
And we have the cure for that worrying in Christ who will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Now, again, I don't want you to think that I'm just saying these things and I don't know it personally. No, I've, I've dealt with these things personally myself. Even this past week, I don't know how many times I told Kayla, it seems like no matter what I'm preaching on, the week before, I will battle all of those things in my own life. And this was one of them. This past week, I was worried about some of the most insignificant, trivial things you've ever heard of. I won't even get into some of them, but some of them I went to Kayla and I said, I can't believe I'm worrying about this right now. My only thought was, it's got to be some sort of spiritual warfare that's going on because I'm preaching this on Sunday. And so what was the cure? Well, I put into practice exactly what I'm telling you this morning. I kept redirecting my gaze to Christ and I kept realizing and recognizing and rereading if I had to the promises of God to remind myself that he truly does care for us. So if this is you this morning, you, you battle anxiety, you battle worry, you battle fear on a regular basis, I want you to know that there's hope. That hope is in Jesus. As he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God will lift the burden from our shoulders and he will give us peace, calmness, and delight so that we don't become consumed with self, but we're able to be generous with what we have because we trust what God is doing. At the same time, you might be asking yourself this morning, what is it that makes this sort of anxiety so sinful anyway? Well, number two, we see anxiety is sinful because it doubts the goodness of God and it believes that it can solve its own problems. Anxiety of this sort is sinful because it doubts the goodness of God and believes, wrongly I might add, that it can solve its own problems. It thinks that it can become self-sufficient. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. This sort of worry thinks that by worrying, it's gonna clothe itself. This sort of worrying thinks that by worrying, a couple extra digits might just be added to the bank account. This sort of worrying thinks that by being consumed with all of these thoughts, life, is going to go on longer. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, years will be added to life. And yet Jesus says, no. When you worry in this way, you're not only doubting the very character, the very nature of God, because when you worry this way, you're doubting God's word. In other words, what you're doing is you're saying, I don't believe God is going to keep his promises. I don't believe God is going to keep his word. And so what I need to do is I need to work to fulfill my own needs. And to this, God says, no, that is wrong and that is sinful. We are instead to trust in God. And so Jesus says in verses 26 to 30, here's a couple of considerations. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. But you... Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? None of us. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Consider again each of these points. Birds are largely insignificant creatures from our vantage point. We're not looking for them on a regular basis. Unless you're bird spotting, unless you're hunting a particular bird, or you happen to look up and you see an eagle flying overhead, or you happen to look at your shoulder and for some other reason recognize there was a bird nearby, you're not going to regularly think about them. And yet, God cares for them. God provides for them. There are birds right now across the world in China, in Thailand. Maybe that's a better example. 
that no human eye will ever look upon. God feeds each one of them. They're not working for it. They're not storing. They're not worrying about it. But God has prepared the worm and the ground for each one of them. He has provided the seeds that they need in order to live and so on and so forth. He has given them everything that they need. But did God send his only begotten son to die for a bird? No, of course not. Do those birds possess eternal souls? No, of course not. God cares for them because he delights in them, but how much more does God care and delight for in us? Those whom he sent his son to die for, those who do possess eternal souls. Likewise, Jesus says, can you add minutes to your life by worrying? No. No more can you make yourself taller or shorter than you actually are. Can you add a single second or take away a single second from your life? So such worrying is pointless. God has numbered your days just as he has numbered the hair on your head and he will not let one slip away. Likewise, consider flowers. Flowers, again, largely insignificant things that God causes to grow. He, he makes them beautiful. There are some incredibly beautiful flowers in the world and God causes each of them to grow. He gives them the sun that they need. He gives them the oxygen that they need. He gives them the rain that they need. And again, consider there are flowers in this world that we'll never see, that nobody will ever see. Nobody will ever enjoy except God himself. And so in his enjoyment of them, God provides for them because he delights in them. But are flowers living beings? In one sense, yes, they are. But are they living beings with souls? No. Did God send the only begotten son to die for a flower? No. You might have tree huggers today, but God was not hugging any trees in that way. He sent his son to die for us. So if God takes delight in those things, how much more does he take delight in us? And if God provides for those things, how much more will God provide for us? One of my favorite examples to use is to consider our universe, how there are unseen solar systems and galaxies all over the place filled with stars and planets that no person will ever see, no telescope will ever happen upon. And yet I'm sure that they are beautiful. They are amazing to see. So why did God create them? for his own enjoyment, for his own pleasure, for his own delight. Why does God uphold them? For the same exact reasons. He gives them all they need to continue on. Now, if God's caring for the universe in that way, will he not much more care for you and I? The answer is, of course he will. And so rather than doubting the goodness of God, we must look to the power of God, to his infinite goodness and mercy and love and grace and recognize this God cares for us. He cares for you. He cares for me. And so rather than trying to solve my own problems, I should give my problems over to the Lord. As Jesus called me to do, to lay my burdens upon him because his shoulders are strong enough to carry them. And in so doing, I'll find peace. I'll find rest for my weary, anxiety-ridden soul. Begins, of course, with salvation, repenting of our sins and trusting in Jesus. But he doesn't forget about us once we're saved. He continues to delight in us. He continues to provide for us. And he does so ultimately, not only for his own delight, but for his own glory as well. And so we see, as we begin to make the contrast more obvious, number three, Anxious people distrust God, but contented people seek God and find all they need. So anxious people distrust God, but contented people seek God and find all they need. The contented one who knows that just as surely as God upholds the universe, so too will he uphold me until he calls me home. The one who is content that Jesus is my great treasure, that he is supplying all my needs according to his riches and glory, that person finds continual joy, continual assurance, continual rest in what God supplies for us in Christ. 
Let's look, verses 31 to 33. Therefore, Jesus says, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all of them will be added to you. They'll be yours. Now you've got to have your heart set on the right thing, as we saw last Sunday, you need to have your affection set on Christ, your eyes set on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We need to live for God, not for self. And when we do this, he'll supply everything. No need for worry, no need for fear. He will supply every one of our needs according to his riches in glory. But I do want you to note that the very question itself that Jesus is asking here, the very thing he's telling us not to do, presupposes that there will be times in our lives of struggle, of trial, of trouble. There will be instances where, yeah, we're not entirely sure where we're going to get the money to pay that bill or, or how we're going to deal with this difficult individual or how we're going to do all of the things that we need to do on one particular day. There will be times of concern. Jesus is not telling us he's going to give us a trouble-free life. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. In this world, Jesus says, you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world, he says. And so here he's not saying you're going to have a trouble-free life. What he is promising you, however, is that in spite of the trouble, you can have a worry-free life. And you can have that through trusting in him. You can have an anxiety-free life by trusting in him and being content in what he has given. Jeremiah Burroughs, great Puritan, wrote this book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. I highly recommend that book. But in it, he defines contentment in actually a ton of different ways. If you know anything about the Puritans, they don't really give you one definition. They give you like 30 definitions by explaining everything that contentment is not. And then we'll give you 30 more definitions telling you what contentment actually is. So here's just one of the ways that Burroughs describes it. But I really like this. He says, contentment is freely submitting to and taking pleasure in God's disposal. Perhaps some of you may say, like David, it is good that I was afflicted. But you must come to say this, it is good that I am afflicted. Not just when you see the final good fruit that has been wrought, but you must begin to say when you are afflicted, it is good that I am afflicted. Whatever the affliction, yet through the mercy of God, mine is a good condition. So in other words, if you wake up in the morning and you go, I am really tired. I did not get a good night's sleep last night. The kids were up 14 different times. Things did not go well. I might be speaking to myself right now. You wake up in the morning and you go, mine is a good condition. The Lord was pleased to put me here in this scenario for his providential purposes and they are good and it's working for my good and for his glory. And so I'm gonna trust in him and in that contentment, I'm gonna do all that I can to glorify him. You might wake up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going into work and today's that day I have to deal with that really nasty coworker of mine and I'm gonna have to deal with them all day because I, I don't know, I'm gonna be stuck in a car with them. If that's you, if you find yourself in a scenario like that, you're able then to say, but this is a good affliction for me to have. And I am content in Christ. And so rather than being anxious and worried about how I'm going to make conversation for eight hours or how I'm not going to argue with this person or throw them out of a moving vehicle, instead, I'm going to be content with what God is doing in my life. And I am going to trust in him. And rather than being anxious and worried, I'm going to be generous with everything that I have. I'm going to be generous today with my time. I have a whole lot to get done but rather than being consumed with self, I'm going to look to the needs of others and I'm going to be generous. And in so doing, I know God's going to supply not only my needs, but their needs as well. And he's going to do so for his glory. This is the opposite then of the Gentiles. The Gentiles are used a number of times within chapter six as an example of 
distrust. We see them earlier in verses seven and eight. And look again with me. Chapter six, verses seven and eight. It says, when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Remember the Gentiles ranting and raving and rambling, thinking that by much talking and ritual, they would get the attention of their false gods. That is a symptom of anxiety. They were worried and they were fearful and they had every right to be because they didn't know the true God. Again, we see them used as the example here in verses 31 to 32. Don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the unsaved, the pagans, they seek after these things. But your heavenly father knows what you need. Here's the good news, beloved. If you know the Lord, you're not a Gentile any longer. You're not a foreigner estranged from the Lord because of your sin. You are a child of the living God. And God, as your heavenly father, delights to provide for your needs as his child. So rather than being anxious and consumed by fear and doubt and worry, you can trust in the provision that God is going to deliver. Because it will be perfect. It'll be exactly what you need until... He calls you home. And even then the provision will still be perfect. So let's say you're one who constantly worries about what day you're going to die. You're just not sure when that day is going to come, but you are convinced every day will be that day. Again, I think this is why they were right to say that I was a hypochondriac when I was a kid, because I was probably the only eight-year-old waking up every day certain that that would be the day I was going to be done in by something or other. If that's you, recognize God's going to keep you alive until he calls you home. Once that day comes, there's nothing we can do to change it. There's nothing we can do to take seconds from it or to add seconds to it. God has that time appointed and we can trust in his infinite goodness that he knows best. Again, whatever your worry is, God will supply. God will provide in Christ Jesus. And so fourthly, we see, and here's a very important point to make, anxious thoughts waste time, but the contented God seeker glorifies God each day. Anxious thoughts waste time, but the contented God seeker glorifies God each day. Verse 34, Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. At first glance, slightly confusing. Might maybe even shocking because maybe you look at that and you think that Jesus is saying, don't be anxious today, but tomorrow all rules are gone. You can be as anxious as you want to be. It's not what Jesus is saying. What applies to us today will still apply to us tomorrow as well. What Jesus is simply saying is this, take things one day at a time. If you have a giant burden on your shoulders, take it one day at a time. Trust in the goodness of God, trust in the graciousness of God to supply and to provide your every need, but you can worry about tomorrow when you get there. Doesn't mean you shouldn't make provision for tomorrow. Doesn't mean that it's wrong to have savings or to save up for your children. Those things are not wrong, they're good. The point is, you're not to doubt the promises of God. What is true of God today will still be true of God tomorrow. So what anxiety will do is it will cause you to become so consumed with yourself that you fail to see the needs of others. You will fail to see the need to share the gospel. You will fail to see the need to glorify God. You will become so self-consumed until eventually you'll just self-destruct. You'll fall into despair and depression and eventually you'll become that one who is idle, unable to take another step, unable to move. But the one who is content, the one who loves Jesus because Jesus first loved you. The one who knows the, the infinite riches of salvation that have been wrought in our lives through Christ. The one who knows God in this way and the one who has this sort of contentment is going to redeem the time, is going to glorify God, is going to do good for others. And then we will be that city on a hill, a light, that cannot be hidden. And when others see our manner of lives, the way that we don't worry, but the way that we trust, the way that we're not anxious, but instead joyful and content in Christ, when others see this, 
they will glorify our Father in heaven. So beloved, let us look then to Christ. He's not only the author and finisher of our faith, he is the supplier of all of our needs. And as we look to Christ, let us be content in him and let us battle this anxiety with faith and trust in the promises of God and contentment in what God has provisioned for our lives. Stand with me as we pray together. Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you once more for the truth of your word. We thank you, O Lord, that we need not fret or worry or be riddled with anxiety because, Lord, we don't need to doubt you, but instead we can trust in you, your goodness, and your promises. And in Jesus and the salvation that he has brought to us, we can be truly content and joyful and happy. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning, if there is one struggling with anxiety and fear, I pray most importantly they would know Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith, as the provider and supplier of all good things, and that they would learn contentment in him. And Lord, as you teach us to learn this contentment, as you teach us to live according to this contentment, I pray that you would send us forth in the joy of the Lord to continually honor, serve, and glorify you not to be self-consumed, but instead to be seekers of your kingdom and your righteousness. Knowing again the promise, Lord, is that you will then add all those needs to us. We praise you, we love you, we thank you for this, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.